Herzlich willkommen zu Roter Faden. Mein Name ist Tabea Winter und ich bin Redakteurin von Klasse gegen Klasse. Wir sind eine unabhängige linke Online-Zeitung, von und für ArbeiterInnen, Jugendliche und Unterdrückte. Herausgegeben wird Klasse gegen Klasse von der revolutionären internationalistischen Organisation RIO. Wir sind Teil eines internationalen Zeitungsnetzwerks. Roter Faden, der Podcast von Klasse gegen Klasse. Unser heutiges Thema ist Hegemonie und Revolution bei Gramsci. Dabei soll es um Gemeinsamkeiten und Differenzen unserer Strategie zu der des italienischen Revolutionärs Antonio Gramsci gehen. Dieser Vortrag wurde im Rahmen des Rio Sommercamps aufgenommen. Unser Redner ist Giacomo Turci. Er ist Genosse bei unserer italienischen Schwestergruppe der Vier, die internationalistische revolutionäre Fraktion. So, good morning to everyone, comrades. Uh, today we will talk about uh, the figure of Antonio Gramsci, the Italian revolutionary, and the concept of hegemony, which you know is kind of related. Yes, it's kind of related with uh, Gramsci thought. Um, well, still today, Antonio Gramsci is one of the most known, read, and translated Italian political authors, and not just political in the whole world. So. Uh, in, especially in some countries and continents, is a sort of uh, important figure, not just for Marxism, Marxism, but for the political left and in general to think of some political categories uh, in the political debate. So uh, it's easy to find, you know, uh, common grounds of debating with other currents about Gramsci, other re-readings of Gramsci, so different position about his legacy. So it is important for us to establish a Marxist point of view uh, about Gramsci. In the Trotskyist faction, uh, like for different years uh, by now, uh, the comrades tried to recover and enhance the um, in inheritance of Antonio Gramsci as a Marxist politician and try to put uh, his thoughts in the context of the rise of the communist international and uh, among other political thinkers like Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, etc. So in the European debate about uh, revolutionary Marxists in the first years of the 20th century. Um, I will try to give uh, like a brief uh, sketch of his life so uh, you can see also on a historical point of view uh, how he came to Marxist revolutionary ideas and how we came to study hegemony. Of course, I, I'll try to be brief in general, so if you have a question, if you want to deepen some points, we can do it in the debate. So, uh, Antonio Gramsci was born in Sardinia, which was part of the Kingdom of Italy in, in 1891, um, from a, quite a poor family. Uh, his elder brother, Gennaro, became socialist uh, working uh, and studying in, uh, in Turin in Piedmont when he went back in Sardinia he was quite important for Gramsci to become a socialist in his young age uh, he was really good in his studies so he was able to go to the university in Turin and then he joined the socialist party we had a, a big Italian socialist party at the time like the SPD in Germany and he became part of the local left wing um, in 1919 uh, together with other mostly young comrades he founded this uh, journal then later it became like a daily newspaper l'ordine nuovo the new order and and they became uh, really intertwined and um, close uh, to the rise of uh, workers um, commissions inside factories, in, especially in Turin and in northern Italy, you have to think that mm, by the time uh, a lot of factories was concentrated in Piedmont and in general in Lombardy and in northern Italy, so it was like the core of the possible uh, class struggle in Italy. And, and, and this journal was uh, very related uh, in the debate about how to uh, think uh, of the rise of, of the working class as a political subject and also uh, the themes, for example, of workers' control 
and you know the, the ways uh, to go beyond capitalism and to establish uh, a society uh, with the rule of the working class so not just the the state power but all the aspects of this possible new society um, in those years between 1919 and 1920 so quite immediately after the first world war uh, there was a rise of class struggle in Italy uh, especially in, in northern Italy in particular in the summer of 1920 uh, there was a massive lockout by, by um, the bourgeoisie uh, trying to end uh, a strike so uh, more than 300 factories were occupied in northern Italy um, there were workers councils uh, like just uh, inside the factory and not uh, in the territory as Soviets uh, there were red guards they were uh, restarting production etc etc so it was uh, a really historical moment of class struggle in Italy uh, these comrades fully supported um, this rise of class struggle but the, the party at the national level, the Socialist Party, didn't want to uh, organize and lead the struggle. So they were defeated in the end. And um, in this precise period, uh, Gramsci uh, comes closer to other left-wing comrades inside the Socialist Party. And, and they uh, go towards the foundation of a common left-wing faction inside the Socialist Party. So, uh, they were all in agreement about supporting uh, the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Party and the foundation of the Communist International, which had happened in 1919. Uh, by 1921, there was the Socialist Party Congress. Uh, they presented uh, a left-wing uh, communist uh, platform. They actually lose the Congress and they decided to split immediately to form the Italian section of the Communist International. Um, then Gramsci um, lived for three years abroad, mainly in Moscow, so in close contact uh, to the main leaders of the Communist International, like Lenin, Zinovia, Trotsky, etc. Et and by 1924, uh, he was able to come back in Italy despite the rise of fascism because he was elected as a deputy so he couldn't be arrested so simply. Uh, so he dedicated these years from 1921 then until his arrest in 1926 as we will see uh, to think of uh, the possible evolution of Marxist revolutionary politics so uh, related to the Communist International in a Western society so with important differences related to uh, the backwardness of Russian society. So to make the Bolshevism European, Western, etc. To find a way to make the revolution in the developed Western countries. Um, by 1926, he was able to form a, a more general point of view about this um, in this uh, thesis of Lyon. Um, they are called Thesis of Lyon because the Congress of the Communist Party in 1926 uh, was held in France, in Lyon, and, and he was able to frame an analysis of the social forces in Italy, so to understand the, uh, the point, uh, the initial point uh, to develop revolutionary, a revolutionary strategy in Italy, and uh, how to uh, translate, let's say, the lessons of the Russian Revolution in a program uh, for politics in Italy. Um, just a few months later than the Congress, he was arrested together with a lot of Italian uh, leaders of the party. So uh, also the other main leader of the party, Amadeo Bordiga, which was the leader of the ultra-left, which was, uh, became the minority in 1926. Uh, so Gramsci was uh, condemned to 20 years of prison. Uh, well, he died before because he died in 1937 uh, because uh, he had a, a pure health status, so he wasn't able to, to live, you know, for 20 years in prison. Um, in prison, uh, he became, he became, he, he began to um, write this famous uh, work of his, the prison uh, notebooks. 
the vast majority of them, they are uh, 33 big notebooks, uh, were written between 1929 and 1935. And um, let's say that uh, when we talk about um, the thought of Gramsci about hegemony, they are basically inside these notebooks. There are political uh, articles, uh, essays, etc. Previews of this period, but uh, Gramsci is famous for this formulation. Today we are not talking about all the main concepts he elaborates in the prison notebooks because they are a lot, a lot of pages. So we, we will stay uh, around the concept of, of Germany. And we have to clarify one thing. Uh, it's not that Gramsci uh, invents the term. Uh, the term is quite old, it has a Greek origin and let's say that uh, it was uh, taken uh, by a lot of um, political um, figures, not just Marxists, back in the 19th uh, century. So it became famous also in the, in the Marxist uh, European social democracies by the end of the 19th century and Lenin elaborated a lot himself on the concept. Um, it comes from ancient Greek and the main idea, which of course is recovered by Gramsci and elaborated, uh, is that um, a part of the art of leadership, um, of the art of command, is not just to dominate enemies, but to um, be uh, an ally and a guide for other parts of society in order to enlarge your front uh, against your enemy. So you're not just a leader of your group, but you're also a guide and a leader uh, in another level with, for other social groups. So, of course, uh, it was really important uh, as a concept for the bourgeoisie to think of uh, uh, the possibility of becoming uh, the dominant class, uh, you know, in Europe and in the world through revolution or passive revolutions and uh, and so it became also important for the proletarian class uh, to think of how to overcome the bourgeoisie through socialist revolution uh, getting hegemony on the vast majority of uh, of the exploited and the oppressed so uh, to effectively represent a really vast majority of society in the process of socialist revolution um, we could say that there was uh, quite a common understanding on the concept uh, by Marxists uh, at the beginning of the 20th century after the, the fight of Karl Marx against the reformist position of La Salle in, Ger in Germany uh, in the process of the founding of the SPD in the previous years um, because uh, Marx was able to uh, defeat ideologically the idea that the working class was a revolutionary class and the remaining parts of the modern society were just a reactionary uh, united front against the working class. So Marx uh, himself put the idea that the working class can have allies, uh, allies in the socialist revolution. It's not that all the population can and will be against the, the proletarian class. Uh, so. Um, Gramsci took a lot of uh, concepts by this Marxist tradition of renewing the concept of hegemony for the purpose of socialist revolution. He took also example uh, from Lenin, from the Re Russian Revolution uh, process, um, also because uh, Lenin was recognized also by his political opponents to be able to practically success in uh, building this hegemony of the working class over uh, other sectors. You have to think about that in, in the Russian society the proletariat was like 10% of the population. So it was really ob obvious that they could not form a majority by themselves in the councils in the Soviet because the vast majority of the population were peasants or peasants uh, staying in the army. So in, of course in Russia it was really important to develop a thought and a political uh, practice around the concept of hegemony. 
So Gramsci is really inspired by the thought and the, the action of the Bolsheviks. Um, we can also say an, another premise uh, before coming to the prison, uh, prison net notebooks that um, one uh, objective uh, premise, historical premise of the possibility for the proletariat to develop uh, hegemony in contemporary society uh, can be seen in the um, uh, historical tendency of the pauperization and proletarianization of the petit bourgeoisie and uh, the modern uh, middle class, so specialized workers, intellectual workers, who, um, who get a similar or identical condition to the proper proletariat, so the proletariat is able to get, uh, you know, more scientific knowings uh, from people that they live in the same conditions because they are not uh, so separated la like in the Middle Age, uh, the different classes, uh, culturally speaking, politically speaking, economically speaking. So, uh, uh, with the, the really uh, accumulation of capital and de uh, development of bourgeois society, it, it becomes easier in historical terms for the proletariat uh, to gain uh, the political premise of, of hegemony. Uh, of course, uh, in the manifesto you can, by Marx and Engels, you can find some optimistic views about this and, and the task of the 20th century Marxist, like Gramsci, was to elaborate about the complexity of getting hegemony, uh, thinking of the differences and the common points with the middle class, the petit bourgeoisie, etc., etc., which, which still existed and still exists now, of course. It's not like the development of capitalism make everyone proletariat. Uh, so. Um, and so in the, in the prison notebooks, uh, Gramsci tries to go beyond his first elaboration uh, about uh, this process of uh, getting uh, technical, scientific, uh, cultural knowledge by the working class, not just uh, in the context of the factory, but in the context of society. So, uh, of course, this is um, all united with the thought about uh, the necessity of forming a revolutionary party and not just a, a broad socialist party. So, um, he needs the, uh, the need, he understands the need to, to study uh, the concrete uh, conditions, uh, the concrete forces uh, that uh, can stay in opposition to revolutionary politics and proletarian hegemony. So, uh, like also Trotsky, he develops uh, a deep thought about uh, the conservative forces of the working movement, like the trade union bureaucracy. You know that it, it was common understanding in the Communist International uh, that the um, big trade union bureaucracy acted as agent of the bourgeoisie inside the workers' movement. So Gramsci tries to elaborate this thing uh, uh, related to hegemony, of course, and, um, and he um, finds this definition really, really useful for us uh, today of the integral state in this mean. Um, of course, in bourgeois society, we know that the state is not neutral, is not above classes. It, it is a, a, an instrument of the, of the bourgeoisie to dominate all the society through politics, uh, through laws, through police. Uh, Gramsci says that uh, in developing uh, capitalist, um, so in Western, Western society, more uh, developed societies, uh, the bourgeoisie tends to uh, make, um, enlarge the state uh, tasks to other social forces. So it's not just the state uh, becoming uh, too much extends, but it, it can, uh, you know, outsource some tasks to other forces. So uh, Gramsci says, of course, in Russia you have this powerful czar state with a powerful police that repress revolutionary, etc., etc., really uh, extended in the country. Um, in Italy and Western countries, um, the state is like the more advanced trench in a system of social trenches to defend uh, bourgeois, like, like in war, of course it, it is related to the First World War with trenches, uh, trench warfare, 
the state is the most advanced trench in a system of trenches uh, defending bourgeois and bourgeois hegemony. So he says that uh, the trade union bureaucracy acts in a historical general sense uh, a function of police against the workers' movement. So th they are concretely able to stop strikes, uh, to make reformist position uh, stronger and to um, try to not uh, develop class struggle and so political conscience, social conscience and the revolutionary party, uh, historically speaking. So uh, Gramsci uh, tries to, to get a more complex view on how uh, bourgeois politics are able to contrast uh, revolutionary proletarian policy, uh, just not taking into account the, the state, but also all other conservative forces um, in society and in the proletarian movement itself. Because, of course, Gramsci doesn't theorize that uh, bureaucratized trade unions are not part of the workers' movement. They are part of the workers' movement, but they uh, can develop this really strong conservative force that uh, which can become ultimately the the most powerful force against revolution uh, and you have the example uh, at the end of the first world war also in germany that the main force the main counter revolutionary force the most powerful re counter revolutionary force politically politically speaking was the spd itself and the trade union bureaucracy and not the i mean not the army the army was quite small at the time, because of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so, um, trying to link uh, a bit uh, the discourse uh, about hegemony, uh, proletarian hegemony and other forms of hegemony, uh, we can think that uh, today, of course, uh, a lot of um, countries look more like the Western old countries. It's not like we, we have uh, a vast majority of countries in the world with 90% of population with, who are peasants. So in Europe, basically, the majority of the population are workers. Uh, and so uh, also in other uh, old colonial countries, uh, you can find uh, a really important quantitative rise of the proletariat and, and the working class. So uh, we, we could say that uh, the reflection uh, about how to relate to the, not to the rural, but the urban, petite bourgeoisie, a middle class, is really important for us now. So Gramsci thought about hegemony it can be really useful. Also to, to think uh, in a more deep way about the processes of neo-reformism and left populism, also in Europe with Podemos and Syriza. In Italy we had a, a more right-wing populism with the Five Staff Movement. And, and we can say that they are uh, projects in which, of course, these parties are voted by a, a good part, uh, most of the times, of the working class, uh, but they don't want to represent the working class, they don't try to organize inside the working class and the workers' movement, and they practically uh, represent more a sort of uh, sub-hegemony of the petit bourgeoisie and the middle class over the working class. Of course, they cannot um, build a proper hegemony over society because they are not one of the fundamental class in bourgeois societies, so that they are not meant to take political power by themselves. They uh, always come to be the puppet of the, bu the bourgeois dominant class and the, the main bourgeois parties. Uh, so also in Italy, for example, uh, this kind of uh, populist movement always tend to go to national governments in alliance with bourgeois party uh, being their minor allies politically speaking yeah and in this sense Gramsci uh, tries uh, to link his thought uh, to the communist international uh, debate about program about of course in our terms about the transitional program and how to build hegemony, not just in the form of the united front of the working class, but also on the, the vast majority of exploited and oppressed. In this sense, he understands that, uh, for example, fascism uh, must be um, 
of course not just fascism but he is elaborating in the years in which fascism is on government in Italy uh, they can be actually defeated through political and class struggle uh, but uh, one can integrate and must integrate the, the aspiration uh, and the, the program uh, proper to uh, other parts of society like petit bourgeoisie and middle class uh, which uh, in itself tend to elaborate radical democratic demands and not socialist demands because it's the working class that naturally uh, with this revolutionary party uh, produces socialist and communist demands. So uh, he understood that he had to integrate in the political uh, agitation and in the program uh, revendications that are not just socialist but partial and democratic radical so to link uh, to these other social forces and to hegemonize them and so not to be just uh, a pair ally but an hegemon force that can lead and rally other forces against the, the bourgeois government. Of course, uh, it, it doesn't mean uh, like erasing uh, the communist um, demands. So Gramsci is not against Soviets in, the, in his uh, prison notebooks, uh, even if he advocates as a transitional demand for a um, constitution assembly in Italy. Uh, as, a, uh, as a demand to overthrow fascism. Um, the point is that uh, he tries to, you know, in this is not, uh, you, you know, there's the tradition of saying that Gramsci is completely against Trotsky, etc., etc., he's a Stalinist. That's not true at all. He didn't have the same position as Trotsky, he didn't join the left international opposition against, against the Soviet bureaucracy. Well, he ended in, in prison quite soon, so he didn't have a lot of time to, to join the left opposition. And the left opposition in Italy was formed in 1930, so four years later. And, but in this sense, he is quite close to the concept of the uh, transitional program and permanent revolution. Actually, Gramsci says in the prison notebooks that he tries uh, through uh, hegemony and other concepts to find a current form of the revolution in permanence, as said by Karl Marx. Uh, so most of times when he criticized Trotsky uh, is because he, he couldn't study a lot uh, Trotsky thought and especially after 1926. So Gramsci wasn't able to read the, the book The Permanent Revolution. So most of times he, he thinks Trotsky has best position because he doesn't know uh, the precise uh, position of Lev, uh, Lev Trotsky. And so uh, also Gramsci uh, tries to uh, get, uh, to put a bridge uh, between the radical democratic conscience of a larger mass and the ne historical necessity of uh, out organization of society, so the historical necessity of forming councils, councils of workers, etc., uh, etc. Et so, uh, getting to a superior form of democracy, uh, respecting to the to the bourgeois one. Um, the problem with the inheritance of Gramsci is that uh, these prison notebooks, uh, the Communist Party was able to to take them from the from the fascist regime and to publish them uh, under the, the leadership of Palmiro Togliatti, the general secretary, uh, secretary of the Communist Party uh, for years and years after the war. And they uh, had a cut and copy, you know, policy about uh, changing some details and aspects and the order of the prison notebooks. So until the 70s, we couldn't read uh, the complete version of the prison notebooks in the in the proper order uh, with the critique edition um, so uh, he was able to manipulate a bit the prison notebooks to make uh, Gramsci compatible with Togliatti's idea of an Italian way to socialism in which hegemony was uh, mainly cultural like a cultural debate with bourgeois tendencies and parties to prepare the bourgeois society to accept uh, the majority in parliament of the Communist Party. So the goal of the Communist Party uh, was the old goal 
you know, of the SPD to get the majority of the votes and, and try to get closer to socialism uh, through reforms and law wi without deepening the, the class struggle, without a revolutionary strategy. Um, the problem is that uh, when one actually studies Gramsci, he finds that uh, from 1921 is really clear about uh, trying to think of a revolutionary strategy uh, for a Western society. And one has to take into account that uh, when he uh, writes these prison notebooks, uh, he has to think of censorship. So uh, he cannot use terms like the uh, proletarian dictatorship. Uh, he doesn't mention the Revolutionary Party, but um, like all the time he calls it the modern prince, referring to Machiavelli's work. So uh, you have to think that hegemony is not like a fetishism of Antonio Gramsci, but it's a way to talk about other topics that we know like United Front, uh, well, of course, some topics about the Revolutionary Party, um, build, building uh, a socialist consent, etc., etc. So uh, you find this uh, strong and large definition of hegemony in Gramsci also because he, he, he was in, in prison. So probably if, if he could write all this stuff outside prison more freely, it would be more uh, complex and accurate, of course. But nonetheless, we, we think that uh, Gramsci, uh, despite his limits uh, as a revolutionary politician, is a great thinker, not just on hegemony for, uh, for Marxist thought, uh, also in the 21st century. And we also think that um, he is the one in Italy who got closer and closer uh, to actual Bolshevism and in fact the, the, the international communist, uh, the international, uh, the communist international, sorry, in 1919 said that the Gramsci's group was the closest group to Bolshevism in Italy. And, and, and we also recognize that his struggle against ultra -left leftism in Italy um, gives us uh, at least uh, an embryo of a Bolshevik uh, tradition and inheritance in Italy against uh, a sectarian and propagandist view. So um, he, he could go beyond the first year of the Communist Party in which you had, you know, struggle, economic struggle, struggle inside the trade union, militancy inside the trade unions, and then uh, political general propaganda. So you had this kind of two uh, half hegemonies which didn't make one general hegemony. And the point with Gramsci is uh, the working class is not just trying to better uh, its condition with, uh, with this conflict, with uh, class struggle. Uh, they have to become uh, the, the main force and the first force, the leading force of the emancipation of humanity. And in this sense, hegemony is necessary to have the vast majority of society, all the uh, exploited and oppressed, uh, united uh, with a common uh, struggle program um, and auto organization against the bourgeois state, against the bourgeoisie, not just to better their condition but to overthrow capitalism. Thank you. Das war's mit dem roten Faden. Bei Fragen, Kommentaren oder Wünschen schreibt uns gerne. Unsere Arbeit finanziert sich ausschließlich über Spenden, deshalb freuen wir uns, wenn ihr was da lasst. Wenn euch der Inhalt gefallen hat und ihr Lust habt, mit uns aktiv zu werden, dann meldet euch bei uns. Wir sind aktiv in Kämpfen der Jugend, in den Krankenhäusern oder in den Universitäten. Wir freuen uns auf euch. Alle Infos findet ihr in der Beschreibung.